I so much love the thrill of hope. Welcome to Calvary. C.S. Lewis is one of my favorite authors, and in 1940, with all the wisdom and experience that a 42-year-old man could muster, Lewis tackled the problem of pain and suffering. As World War II raged, many people were struggling with the apparent absence of God in the midst of so much suffering and pain and evil. So Lewis wrote the book, The Problem of Pain. It was an analytical study of the theological and philosophical answers to the questions of God's goodness in hard times. And, and actually, I don't think it's one of his best books. But then 12 years later, Lewis met Joy Davidman. He, he'd never been married. He told many people that he never wanted to be married, but Joy won his heart. She was a writer from New York with a personality that matched her name. They, they wrote letters back and forth. She visited England, and years later, they were married. While they were courting, Joy discovered that she had cancer. In fact, it was in the painful process of discovering that he might lose her that Lewis realized how much he actually loved her. So they got married. The cancer went into remission, and they had two incredible years together. And then the cancer came back with a vengeance, and Joy died. Twenty years earlier, he had analyzed the problem of pain. Now he's experiencing the problem of pain. God's silence in the midst of his suffering. And in those private moments of his greatest lament, Lewis wrote a different book. It's called A Grief Observed. And in it, he says things that sound a whole lot like the laments scattered through the Psalms and, and the prayers of the people of God. In the midst of his pain, Lewis found God to be distant and silent. Lewis is lamenting when he writes these words. He, he writes, but go to God when your need is desperate, when all other help is vain. And what do you find? You find a door slammed in your face, the sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside. And after that silence, he wrote, you may as well turn away. The longer you wait, the more emphatic the silence will become. There are no lights in the windows. It might be an empty house. Was it ever inhabited? It, it seems so Lewis writes, once upon a time. Isaiah 64 is what we're looking at today. It's, it's a part of a prayer. It's a message to the people of God, but it's also a corporate prayer. In the Old Testament era, corporate prayers were often used as a part of worship. They were spoken together or sometimes spoken over the community of faith, like our abounding hope prayer. But Isaiah 64 is not just a corporate prayer, it's a lament. Uh, a lament is a prayer that cries out to God in desperation for his presence, for his hand. It's a prayer that, that, that pounds on the seemingly locked gates of heaven. It's a prayer of deep pain and intense frustration and confusion even about the absence and the silence of God. And, and yet, a, a lament is not, listen, it's not just the hopeless cry of a discouraged people or the venting of frustration or murmuring and complaining from people who, who miss their comfort and control. A, a lament is a profound statement of faith in God. A lament hurls its hurt to God with a conviction of faith in the expectancy of hope that God can do something, that because God is God, all is not lost, so we need not give up. In fact, a lament is less like the surrender of hope and it's more like a fight with God. It's a, it's a fight, a wrestling with God for more God. And in fact, if you think about it, perhaps more than any other type of prayer that could be associated with Christmas, a lament is a Christmas prayer. You know, that very first Christmas came after 400 years of God's silence. The last word spoken by God came through the prophet Malachi when he said, Surely the day of the Lord is coming. But 400 years later, there had been no day of the Lord. There had been no words from God, no pillar of fire at night or cloud by day, no burning bushes, no angelic messengers or even prophets, only war and oppression and poverty. And I just, I can guarantee you that when the people of God gathered during those four centuries, more than a, a time or two, they prayed the lament found in Isaiah chapter 64. Look at verses one and two. Oh, that you would burst from, or some of your translations say rend, oh, that you would rend the heavens, rip the heavens open and come down. How the mountains would quake in your presence as fire causes water to burn and water, wood to burn and water to boil. Your coming would make the nations tremble. And then your enemies would learn the reason for your fame. Or in some of your Bibles, it says they would know your name. Now please 
don't hear these initial words of Isaiah 64 as, as just kind of this whispered hope or a private moment of wistful pondering. Hear them as the fight of faith for more God. In this prayer, the people are lamenting God's absence. They're crying for God to come down. Now, now listen, this cry does not mean that, that the people in those days thought God lived up in the clouds or out there somewhere. In fact, the Israelites had developed a, a very healthy theology of God's presence, and, and yet they still had this sense of God's absence, God's silence in the midst of their groaning. Sometimes life takes us through those times, right? I like how another pastor put it in a sermon on this fight with God for his presence. He, he said that we live our lives in the tension between our theology and our biography, between the tension of what we hope to be true about God and what we actually experience in our day-to-day -day lives that, frankly, can often be filled with heartache and hardship and unexpected pain or loss. Now, this tension is it is found in, in almost every chapter of Scripture. And, and in many of the chapters of our own lives, these words are a few thousand years old, but, but hasn't some version of this lament come out of your mouth in the midst of difficult times? It's okay. In fact, sometimes I think that one reason why people don't take Christians seriously is because we've, we've kind of lost our heart to lament. Sometimes it seems like we're more interested in being right than we're interested in weeping. Sometimes it seems we don't take the world's pain seriously. We, we have this, don't worry, God is here and he'll work it out, middle class sweetness. But, but what if God wants us to lament? I mean, what if God wants us to cry out when he's silent? Well, what if he wants us to fight for his presence, to, to wrestle with God for more God? Let me ask you, haven't you ever had a moment where it felt like you were fighting with God? I mean, maybe it was a night when you just couldn't sleep. You were facing a difficulty in your life that was so overwhelming that you could almost physically feel it in your gut. And it, and it deposited this pain and, and uncertainty into the very core of your soul. It was like you were physically fighting something or someone. I would say more than a few of us have had some times like that in the last 20 months, right? I mean, am I the only one? Have you ever felt like you were fighting with God for more of God? Look down through history and the, the, the history of revivals and, and the church spread throughout the world globally. You, you'll find literally hundreds, thousands of stories of people wrestling with God, finding themselves in, in the middle of an experience with a seemingly silent God, heavens like brass. You've heard that phrase. St. John of the Cross called it a dark night of the soul. If, if you've ever experienced that or you're experiencing it now, you're not the only one. In fact, I think most all of us have had some of those moments. And sometimes it's even more pronounced at Christmas, right? This time when everyone tells us we should be merry and glad. But, but listen, Jesus was born into a time and a culture that was everything but merry and glad. He came to a time when the people of God were wrestling, deeply wrestling with the, the, the 400 year absence of God. I know I've had some moments like that. I remember when Pastor Paul Grable died. It wasn't just that I was losing a friend and, and a, a local family was losing their husband and father or a church was losing its pastor. It was, I don't know, it was a wrestling and a fighting for the city because. That's what Paul and I dreamed and schemed about. Man, in those first few months after he died, I had more than a few knocked down, put him up, yelling matches with God, praying at the top of my lungs, somewhere between crying and yelling. <laughs> I remember one night I was driving and it just started pouring out of my mouth. Not the nice spiritual words of prayer that we learn in church. More like the R-rated words of a lament. And in fact, a few of the words I prayed were words we tell our kids they can't say. And I know some of us can't even hardly imagine an R-rated prayer. We, we, we shake our heads like, I don't think that's nice. You can't say that to God. But what if God wants us to lament? Well, what if he wants us to be real with him in prayer? Ben Patterson once said that whenever you get bored with prayer, it's probably a good sign that God is bored too because you're not bringing the real you what if God wants us to show up face to face with our real face? I mean, how can we come face to face with God if we're not willing to show him 
a real face. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. This is not just a, a lament of God's absence. It's, it, it's a plea for more of up there to come down here. Rend the heavens and come down. This is, this is a crying out for Christmas. More Christmas. God, send us more Christ. More presence. Rend the heavens and bring more Christ into my home. God, my neighborhood, work and school. I mean, honestly, shouldn't there be times when what is happening down here so affects our hearts that it, it just brings a lament to our lips? Not, not a lament of judgment, but a lament of compassion. Maybe even a lament of anger and frustration at the hopelessness and, and, and the darkness of our culture, even of the church. See, if we want more Christmas, I believe we must be a people who lament what is happening down here and wrestle with God for more of up there. In his book, Lectures on Revival, Charles Finney once wrote, sometimes Christians talk about unbelievers so coldly scolding rather than feeling the compassion of the Son of God for them. But sometimes brokenness drives Christians to prayer breaking them down, making them mourn with tender hearts. They weep night and day, and instead of scolding and reproaching, they pray. Then he wrote, you can expect revival. Perhaps we protest too much and we weep too little. Perhaps this Christmas we need the gift of tears. Oh God, would you rend our hearts and come in? Would you help us to be tenderly moved by the conditions of of our neighbors and family members and, and, and friends, would you help us weep for the things that break your heart? I'm telling you, I, I believe this with all my heart. What's up there comes down here when we travail in prayer, when we lament with hope. We, we lament as a people of hope because we believe that how it is now is not what is yet to come. I mean, can you just imagine, imagine with me for a moment, what would it, it be like if up there came down here, if, if it was Christmas all year round, every marriage would be healthy. Those with little would receive from those who have too much. People at work would compliment each other behind their backs. Social media would be filled with accounts of good news, courage, and words of grace. No more need for divorce courts or pregnancy resource centers. No more need for abortion. No more battered women or sexual abuse. Every time a, a child is touched, it would be to encourage or comfort, or celebrate, or protect. Every child would, ha would have a family, and every family would love its neighbors. No more school shootings. Martin Luther King Day would be a day of gratitude for all that's been accomplished, rather than a day of grieving for all that may never be accomplished. If up there came down here, think of the addictions that would disappear, the wounded hearts that would be healed. Instead of shame, people would discover that they are a beloved masterpiece of God, created by God for a good purpose. And, and in the midst of it all, <laughs> the presence of God would make every other blessing pale in comparison because ultimately this lament comes from a hunger for God's presence. It is a prayer that is filled with a longing to know him. Oh, that you would burst forth, that you would rend the heavens, God, and come down. How the mountains would quake in your presence, your, your coming would make the nations tremble, and, and then your enemies would learn the reason for your fame. I, I already mentioned to you, I think the New Living Translation misses it in Isaiah 64 to what they translate as, then your enemies would learn the reason for your fame is literally, then they would know your name. And, and yes, of course, I think Isaiah 64 is a, a lament for God's reputation to be made known. And, and we need that today too. But the deeper lament is for God to be known. The word used in verse 2 for know is the word yada. Yada is less of a book knowing and it's more of an experiential knowledge. To know God's name is, is to be intimate with God. The heart of Yada is this loving that brings a deep knowing and being known. See, this is the difference between a lament and complaining. The prayer of lament flows out of a love story. It's, it's more than a discouraged cry for the absence of my hurt. It's a, a desperate cry for the presence of my healer. Yada is a a nearness, a closeness, a, a familiarity that breeds friendship. When, when I think of the moments of this kind of yada that I've experienced over the course of my life, I, I remember 
I remember a day when our family played touch football in the park across the street, Smithfield Street, and no one, this was so unusual, nobody was arguing over rules. Nobody cared who won or lost. We're just playing and laughing. I remember an evening in college when a bunch of us football players gathered in my apartment and had communion. Yada. I, I think of moments where I've walked through hard times with some of you. Those are Yada, knowing times. And, and all sorts of memories come to my mind when I think of intimacy with Lynn, our, our first water fight, the, the birth of our kids, long drives on my day off, times when she's prayed for me, even walking through tough times together. Well, what does it look like to Yada God? Well, for now, without trying to answer all those questions, let, let me simply ask the Christmas question. Is that what you want? And, and I'm talking about something more, something deeper than just a theological I'm saved answer. I, I didn't ask, do you go to church? I'm asking, do you want Jesus more than you want breath? Am I desperate for God? Do I lament for his presence? You say, take away the gifts, turn off the lights, throw out the tree, and you can still experience Christmas, but without his presence, we're, we're left groping for glory and homesick for hope. So cry out, not for more stuff, cry out for more of God, more glory, more hope, more Christmas. That, that's the cry of Christmas, more God. Is your soul on the brink of a lament for God's presence? See, all of this is leading us to Christmas expectancy. And, and I get it. <laughs> what, what at least some, if not all of you, are thinking, how in the world can I tie lamenting to expectancy? How can hope exist with pains groaning in God's absence? And it's only because of this. It's because we've seen him do it before. What he did long ago for others somewhere else, couldn't he do again here for us? L listen to Isaiah 63, verses 3 through 4. The, the prophet prays, God, when you came down long ago, you did awesome deeds beyond our highest expectations. And oh, how the mountains quaked. For since the world began, no eye has seen, no ear has heard about a God like you who works for those who wait for him. He works for those who wait for him. Beyond our expectations, he works for those who wait for him. I mean, can, can you feel just a, a little bit of hope? Just a, a, a bit of expectancy? And, and what is expectancy? It's, it's faith on tiptoe, <laughs> straining to see what is to come because even though I can't quite see it, I, I can't even quite describe it, I, I know it's coming. Expectancy is believing even in the midst of travail that the best is yet to come. It, it goes well beyond knowing about God. It's seeing an empty tomb beyond every bloody cross. It's, it's more than a belief that God can do something. It's the anticipation that he will. It's the spark in your heart that gives you eyes to see a life redeemed from the mess while it's still covered with shame. It is a tenacious hope, a vital optimism that never stops believing that the best is yet to come. Listen, I, I know some of you carry a deep burden for someone or you carry a deep burden for a cause, for something but you've lost hope that anything will change. You're not expectant. You, you rail against the darkness. You complain against the culture, but you don't pray because you're not expectant that God will ever do a new thing. But there is no one like God. No one can do what he can do. And if you don't believe me, Isaiah wants to remind us of God's most awesome deed. <laughs> Listen to his words in Isaiah 64, verses 5 through 8. He, he prays, he writes, you, you come to the help, God, you come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continued to sin against them, you were angry. How then can we be saved? All our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf and like the wind, our sin sweep us, sweeps us away. No one calls on your name, he says, or, or strives to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have given us over to our sins. And yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You're the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Wow. I mean, just, 
Just pause for a moment, would you? Let the holy hush of the Spirit's conviction settle in on our, our hearts. Don't, don't get defensive. This isn't a legalistic rant or hypocritical judgmentalism. This is the Creator's diagnosis of our hearts. This is the reality of our condition apart from Christ. This description of sin's infection, the, the filthy rags. This is the life of those who do not wait for God. And I'm telling you, our sin runs deep. If you knew the totality of my past sin and my present infections and my future failures, you'd wonder why in the world is he a pastor? The sin in my life runs deeper than I care to admit. And, and that is such hard, bad news. But, but here's the good news. Here's the gospel. We wait because there's hope. He's going to rend the heavens and come down. He's going to rend our hearts and come in. We're infected with sin, wanting to do our own thing in our own time for our own glory, our own comfort and control. And so God turns his back on us. He gives us over to our sin. But then when we lament, when we repent and lament and grieve, when we cry out for his presence, something shifts. <laughs> and, and for Isaiah, the prayer turns intimate and personal. And yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We're the clay and you're the potter. Do you hear the shift? Isaiah moves from asking this nation scaring God to rend the heavens with fearsome fireworks to now asking Father God to put his hands on our hearts and shape us in here. The picture of the Father as potter and his people as the clay breaks this lament wide open. It's the new covenant leaking into the Old Testament. It, it's a yada relationship. Rather than God bursting forth, God is invited in. Rather than hardened nations trembling and mountains being broken, the Father is shaping our soft hearts like clay on the potter's wheel. This is God's most amazing deed. He takes us from filthy rags to family from shriveled leaves blowing in the winds of sin to potter's clay being shaped for his purposes. He's the potter. I'm the clay. You're the clay, but our potter is also our dad. <laughs> I mean, do you understand? He, he, is, he is with you. God is so for you, even when he seems silent or absent. Say this to yourself. God's fingerprints are all over my heart. He's shaping me for a Christmas purpose. And I know, sometimes it hurts. I mean, he pushes and he prods and he, he digs his finger into the recesses of our lives, but, but he's shaping you for a purpose. God is using people and events and circumstances right now at this moment, the good and the hard to shape us. The amazing, wonder-filled moments and the painful, uncertain season all being used by him to shape us. Nothing gets by him. Nothing is wasted. He's shaping you. He's shaping me for a Christmas purpose. Do you know what concerns me more than the culture taking Christ out of Christmas? What concerns me is Christians taking Christ out of the church. This is where my, my lamenting comes. I, I love Christ's church and I weep for his church. I've given most of my life to serving the church and at times I've been embarrassed to claim it. I'm, I'm painfully aware of the times that we ignore the Christmas story in order to strive for power. We ignore Mary's song to strive for comfort and control. I'm painfully aware of this every time I hear of another leader's failure and I'm painfully aware every time I consider my own. And yet Christmas reminds us of God's beyond imagination ability to break in, to break through and bring glory out out of the mess and this hope constantly encourages me to step into the mess of the church so that we don't miss the glory of redemption isn't this our christmas purpose to see the church become again a manger for the birth of heaven on earth isn't that the purpose of the church I mean, is church just a place we gather on Sunday morning? No, the, the church is the people of God, empowered by the Spirit of God to love and live like the Son of God. And when this happens, I'm telling you, the glory of God is all over the church. Christmas again and again, heaven invading earth. I know this has been a hard season for many, globally, locally, individually, corporately. 
I was talking to someone this week, the husband of a good friend of hers went into the hospital and, and died soon after of COVID. She said her friend is mad at the world and not on speaking terms with God. And I could multiply similar stories of all kinds of loss and grief over and over and over and over again. But, but I'm telling you with all my heart, I believe there is better yet to come. And while I don't have any idea, I, I can't make you any promises. If our nation shaking God will choose to eradicate COVID and tear down racism and bleed the church dry of partisan politics and heal divisions, I, I can tell you I believe that the potter who is our father is ready to do a deep shaping work in our hearts if we'll wait on him. And that word wait in the Hebrew, it literally means to get twisted together, to get so twisted up in God that we just can't even move unless he moves. When you came down long ago, you did awesome deeds, God, beyond our highest expectations. And oh, how the mountains quaked, for since the world began, no ear has heard, no eye has seen a God like you who works for those who wait for him. Emmanuel, God with us. The hope of Christmas is the hope of God's presence, but listen to me, take fair warning. There is no God like our God. If you think you've got him figured out and all boxed up, I, I gotta tell you, he's not a domesticated God. He's not tame, he's not safe. He's father to the fatherless with a heart bigger than the sky. He's the forgiver of sins and the seeker of the lost. His goodness sustains the world and heals the brokenhearted, but he will turn your life upside down and your heart inside out. I was thinking about this and, you know, I, I think perhaps one reason why we like Christmas Jesus rather than rend the heavens Jesus is because God in a manger seems safe. The soft pink hands of God in the manger cannot take what I consider to be mine. The infant mouth cannot call me to surrender my life. The feet don't even walk, so there's no need to follow. Christmas Jesus is safe, but, but deep down, don't we know? The thrill of hope only comes when we place our, our hearts and our lives in the hands of the King of Heaven. <laughs> and I'm telling you, as much as I hate to wait, He is worth the wait. There is no God like Him who works for those who wait. I think about how often all of my somethings have produced nothing. Sometimes we can be so full of somethings that result in nothing. I, I love strategic planning as part of how God has shaped me. It's a way that he speaks to me and through me. It's a gift that he's given. But every dream, every initiative, every goal, every something we plan will lead to nothing if we do it without God. And so we, we wait. It's almost like Isaiah saying, don't just do something, stand there. But really what he's saying, I don't want you to quit. No matter what happens, don't quit. Don't give up. Wait. Not just in the moment, for a moment. Do it for a lifetime. And pray. <laughs> Listen, prayer is the work of waiting. What well, Waiting is not passive. It, it, it's the most difficult work there is. And prayer is the work of waiting. 20 years ago, uh, a couple of pastors were in the area visiting, doing some training for us in intercessory prayer and, and listening to God. And Lynn and I were visiting with them late one night. We were, we were up at Harvest Fields and, and one of them, in the midst of talking, looked at me and said, Dan, I believe that God has a word. God has a message for you. I said, okay, well, what is it? I'd like to know what is it. And he said, well, I, I'm not exactly sure. It has something to do with a sword. I see a sword. And, and, and I also have this thought. I feel like God gave me, I think that you should know what that means. So I thought about it and, and I prayed and asked Jesus, but I, I got nothing. <laughs> and, and, and then one of the pastors said, you know, a scripture just came to my mind with the thought, ask Dan what he wants more than anything. And I knew right away what it was. It was a Saturday and the next day I was speaking on a passage in the book of Malachi. Lord, open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that cannot be contained. And I shared that and then Brian shared the scripture that God had put on his heart. It was Isaiah 64. Oh, that you would rend the heavens, come down. When you came down long ago, you did awesome things beyond our highest expectations. Would you do it again? For since the world began, no ear has heard, no eye has seen a God like you 
who works for those who wait for him. After we were done praying, I went back to the office. I wasn't done with my sermon. I got done with the sermon about two in the morning. And then I went home and I got out of the car and I looked up in the sky and it's, it's even now hard to describe. The heavens were rended. It was, it was about 2.30 in the morning and, and yet that there was this reddish tinge to the clouds and, and the clouds were in two distinct groups and through the middle was this, was this clear, dark space. <laughs> I want to tell you, I, I know what it is to wait. I, I've prayed that prayer, rend the heavens, for, for 20 years. I prayed it as a promise of what God wants to do, if we'll wait on him, if we'll direct our eyes to him and cry out, God, come again. As we close our time together, I'm going to ask you to listen to this song. It has a promise for you, a promise of hope. Listen to it and, and then come back. P please don't leave. Don't leave early. Come back because I, I want to give us a challenge and then I, I want to pray over you our abounding hope prayer. He's come for us, this Jesus, the thrill of hope, the hope of all humanity. You're gonna see on your screens as we close a QR code and a, 
and a website. And I just encourage you, even now, as I um, explain what it is, just go to that site or go to the QR code. I, I want to ask you to do something with me. On New Year's Day, that's coming up, it's not far away, from midnight on New Year's Eve to midnight on New Year's Day, um, hundreds of us at Calvary will pray. I I'm hoping that well over a thousand hours will go into the first 24 hours of 2022. We're gonna make it a day of prayer for hope. And I'd love for you to join us. There'll be a couple of prayer guides available. Um, they're not quite there yet, but they'll be ready. And, and there's a place to sign up so that you know who you're praying with in those hours and what hours might need to be covered in prayer. You don't have to go anywhere to pray. You can do it in your home or wherever you wanna go. Um, but we just wanna cover it with prayer. I'm suggesting to people that you choose maybe two hours. One at a time that's kinda hard for you, a little bit more of a sacrifice. Like for me, that would be early morning. Maybe for you, it's in the middle of the night. And then one that is kinda prime time for you. So all you gotta do is, is click the QR code or go to calvarysc.org slash prayer for more info and to sign up. I, I'm just asking that together we would make 2022 the most hopeful year ever. As we close, I, I wanna pray our abounding hope prayer over you. It's a corporate prayer. It's part of our 50 days of hope. So would you pray with me? Father God, would you saturate our hearts with hope? When our days are dark, shine your light in our souls. When our eyes are blind to your hand, renew our expectancy. Give us the wide-eyed anticipation of a child waiting on Christmas morning, a deep hope that the best is yet to come. Jesus, saturate our hearts with hope. Give us that spark in our eyes that dares to see a life redeemed from the mess while it's still covered with shame. Give us a subversive hope that loves in the margins, a tenacious what-if hope that perseveres in the face of every missed moment, every failed expectation. Fill us, Jesus, with the hope of resurrection. Spirit of God, saturate our hearts with hope. Fill us with joy and peace. We confess the dryness of our bones, the hope-draining disunity of your church and the brokenness of our families and neighborhoods. Spirit of God, without your power, we have no hope. Fill us again. As in the days of Ezekiel, breathe new life into dry bones. As in the days of Mary, fill us with your presence. As in the days of Acts, empower again a ragtag group of Jesus apprentices so that we might become those who turn the world upside down. Hear our prayers, Lord. Stir our hearts with holy hope. Fill our valleys with the knowledge of your glory. Revive your church and renew your people. Pour out your fierce, sacrificial love through us into our neighborhoods. Let us be the hope givers, bringing the thrill of hope to a weary world in need of rejoicing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.